So tonight we are kicking off a brand new series uh, called Guaranteed Ways to Ruin Your Life. Guaranteed Ways to Ruin Your Life. And throughout the course of the series, we're going to be talking about four things, four things that you should avoid like they plague the plague because they will ruin your life. Now, if you're like me, anytime somebody says the word guaranteed, you know, you're just kind of a little skeptical. I mean, can you really guarantee something? I have trust issues on a number of levels. And so when somebody says, I guarantee something, I'm like, I don't believe you, you know? And so if that's you, I get it. If you're a little skeptical, I get it. Uh, But the series, the reason I can say guaranteed so confidently is because this series is not about theory. This series is about predictable outcomes. Life is full of predictable outcomes. Like you don't even need to to know how it's going to play out. You already know almost, you can almost guarantee how a certain situation or scenario is going to play out, right? You you walk into Target to buy one thing. (laughs) Predictable outcome, you're going to spend $100 and now you're going to be broke and can't have dinner tomorrow. You know, like predictable outcome. And when the family comes over for Christmas, I mean, just experience this. The dinner table is great until politics get in the mix, and then there's drama, and then grandma's going to ask you why you're not married yet. (laughs) Predictable outcome. Um, I want to set the record straight. I am not knocking Taco Bell. I love Taco Bell. I had it three months ago. Every few months, my body can handle it. But when you hit Taco Bell late at night after 11 p.m., because that's about the time, I'm pretty sure that's the only time they're open After you take it in, it is a predictable outcome. It tastes so good for a moment, but only for a moment. You know, like predictable outcome. Ladies, when we've seen this on Instagram, if you're wearing heels and you're walking down a hill, predictable outcome. (laughs) Like it's not going to go well for you. You know, for the fells in the room, and I'm going to encourage you to ask a girl out on a date every chance that you get. But if you you ask a girl out that continually calls you BFF, predictable (laughs) outcome. I mean, shoot your shot, bro, but I mean, you know, maybe go somewhere, a predictable outcome. Life is full of, I just just broke a couple guys' hearts right now. They're not going to listen for their, like, like, oh, man, that's what she meant by that. Um, Go for it, go for it, go for it. They just got married. Uh, But life is full of predictable outcomes, and that's what this series is about, predictable outcomes. If I could even give this series a subtitle, or if I could even give it a, a, a you know, guaranteed ways to ruin your life, and then a title number B or title letter C, it might be guaranteed ways to lead you down a path that will lead to a lot of regret and a lot of pain later. Uh, guaranteed ways to ruin your dating relationships. Uh, guaranteed ways to ruin your friendship. Guaranteed ways to ruin your influence. Guaranteed ways to ruin God's best for your life. Some of y'all in the room need to hear tonight that God has a best for your life. Guaranteed ways for your life. And we don't want you to ruin your life. I don't want you to ruin your life. And I can't think of too many conversations that are so pertinent as we come into a brand new year. Some of you guys are looking at 2019 thinking, yeah, yeah, I can't repeat 2019. I, I can't do 2019 again. I, 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 need, I need a fresh vision. I need, I, need a new, I need new momentum. I can't do 2019 again. You want 2020 to be your year. We want 2020 to be your year. But not only that, I mean, here's the cool thing. We're stepping into a brand new decade now. And I don't want to overplay the decade thing. It's kind of cool, but let's be real. It's kind of like every other year, okay? But it is cool that it's a brand new decade. I mean, we're coming in to the 20s, and as I was preparing for this message, I was thinking back to where I was at the start of this past decade, 2010. And I uh, was in your seat, not here, but I was a junior, a third year at the University of Georgia. I was a college student. And I did not have a girlfriend, like not even prospects. Like I was more single than like a single piece of crap cheese. Like, I mean, I was single, bruh. I didn't, I had just declared a major finance. I was pretty sure I wanted to do ministry, but I wasn't sure that that is exactly what I was gonna do. I didn't know what I was gonna do after school. I mean, I had no idea. Fast forward 10 years later, I'm married, I've got a kid, I've got another one on the way, we bought a house, and I'm getting to lead this college ministry. My life's not perfect, it is far from it. My point is, a lot can happen in 10 years. And so for you, who you wanna become and where you wanna go starts right now. I mean, you could even call this series Guaranteed Ways to Ruin the Future You've Always Dreamed and Hoped For. 
Because you know this. One of my favorite things that Andy Stanley has ever said, he's our senior pastor, that decisions have babies. You know this. You know this. Decisions have babies. They just do. And certain decisions find a way of making their way and forcing their way into your future, even if it is not immediate. That the, the present matters right now because your future matters. And you know that you don't become who you want to become, and you don't grow, and you don't get better, and you don't grow in your faith on accident. No, no, it takes purpose, and it takes intentionality. So where do you want to go, and who do you want to become? It starts now. And so the series the series, it's significant for where you are right now, but the implications of the series are present and future oriented. Guaranteed ways to ruin your life. And where we're gonna start tonight and where we're gonna kind of kick off the series is we're gonna, we're gonna talk about, I believe, a foundational issue for every single human being on the planet, whether you're a Jesus follower or not. This is not, this problem isn't specific to people of faith. This problem is specific to people to humans. I wanna talk about a problem that every single one of us have and every single one of us deal with. I wanna talk about something that lives deep down inside of you. It's always lurking and it's always looking for an opportunity to rear its ugly head and mess something up in your life. Tonight, the first thing that I wanna talk about that I guarantee you will ruin your life is pride. Pride. The the ugliness that we are so quick to point out in other people, you notice this? The the, the ugliness that we are so quick to see in other people, the ugliness that that we are so turned off by, by other people, it's the kinds of people we avoid, it's the kinds of people why we wondered why we roomed with, it's the kind of people why we wonder we started dating. Like it is so quick to see and it is so gross to see in other people. But ironically enough, it's almost impossible to see in your self. I do uh, life with, uh, I've got a a group of guys, a couple of guys that I do life with. I've told you about this and and we get together every so often and and we do life and we we talk about uh, where we're struggling and we talk about, uh, you know, ministry and how to be better husbands and fathers and leaders and we challenge each other and we call each other out and we encourage each other. And this was a little over a year ago, we were having breakfast and one of them said, hey, Sam, and I forget the context within which this came up, but I remember very vividly this moment. He said, Sam, I, I gotta be honest with you. When we're in a conversation, you're very difficult to disarm. You get really defensive really, really quickly. I was like, no, I don't. You're defensive, jerk. Um, <laughs> just kidding. I didn't say that. But I just thought, I remember thinking, well, I mean, yeah, I, I know I do sometimes, but like, like, all, like all the time, like I know I kind of struggle, but what do you mean all the time? He's like, man, it happens all the time. I was like, okay. So I go home that day. I was like, hey, hey, Julie, I got, I got a question. Um, I love you. Uh, <laughs> I, we were having this conversation, and you know, he said that, that I get defensive all the time. I mean, I know I struggle with it, but like really all the, all the time? And she just kind of smiled, and she said, I love you all the time. <laughs> I didn't see it. It's funny. It's like I knew like maybe sometimes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what I thought? I just thought, no, no, no. I'm just having conversations where I'm giving my opinion. It masked itself. It's like, oh, no, 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 I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, you know, what I've researched. I'm telling you what, I, what I've learned. I'm just telling you what's on my mind. I can't be honest anymore. I'm being defensive. But really, that's what it was. It was pride. And I know that my tendency is to do that. What I did not know was how regular it was in my life. It was pride that said, hey, I know better than you. Like, hey, what you're saying is wrong, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you what's actually right. It was pride that was causing me to get defensive and get ready to gear up to say what I'm about to say and not even listen to what is being said to me. Every single one of us have a pride problem. And it's one of the reasons it's so hard to see is we kind of reserve the title of being prideful to the overtly arrogant and cocky, you know? We know people that are cocky and arrogant, and it's like, wow, they're so prideful, (laughs) I'm so cocky. What a jerk. I'm, good thing it's not me. I don't struggle with pride. What's up? You know, we, we, we think if I'm not cocky, if I'm not arrogant, then I don't have a pride problem. But with pride, there's always blind spots. There's always blind spots. The reason it's so hard, watch this. I'm going to prove this to you, the blind spot of pride. Admitting you have a pride problem is admitting you have a problem. Your pride won't let you admit that you have a problem. Therefore, your pride creates the blind spot to see your own pride. For every single one of us, there's blind spots when it comes to pride. And not only that, I mentioned it, pride masks itself in our lives. 
kind of disguise. It's sneaky. It disguises itself in different ways. You know, for some of you, um, pride masks itself in your life as confidence. Oh, no, I'm just confident who God made me. Oh, okay, well, you're yeah, prideful, you know. Uh, that, 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 that it, it masks itself in intelligence. It might mask itself as sarcasm. It might mask itself as like the pursuit of excellence. It might mask itself as like, I'm just looking out for their best interests. No, you're actually demeaning them. It might mask itself in a number of different ways. And the danger for you and for me is to ignore it. The danger for you and for me is to act like it's not that big of a deal. The danger for you and for me is not to create a little bit of space open up our ears and our hearts just a little bit to see maybe there actually is a problem there. C.S. Lewis said it beautifully and so boldly and so strongly. He said, unchastity, which we don't really use that word anymore, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. Pride leads to every other vice. That all of these things that we talk about drunkenness and anger and all the things that I'm like, yeah, those are, those are bad. Yeah, okay, I get it. I mean, I know I struggle, but, but pride, man, they're flea bites. Like they don't even hold a candle to pride because pride leads to every other vice. Pride is the gateway drug. It's the gateway vice. The root of all the ugliness in your heart and in my heart is pride. The root of all the rebellion in your heart and in my heart is pride. The root of all of the broken relationships and drama and unhealth is pride. And ultimately, the root of all of our sin, the verb to sin, is pride. To sin, an intentional departure from God's will for your life, an intentional departure from the Holy Spirit's conviction in your life, an intentional departure from the direction that God has given us to sin ultimately is a matter of pride because what we are saying to God is my way is better than your way. What I want is greater than what you want for me. What I want is more important than anybody I come eyeball to eyeball with. That, yeah, I think C.S. Lewis was right. Pride leads to every other vice. And you know this. Like, pride is that thing that keeps us from apologizing and admitting when we're wrong. You can, like, tangibly feel it, can't you? You can literally tangibly feel pride closing your mouth and literally making you not get up and move towards that person and admitting when you were wrong or apologizing. Pride is that thing that keeps you from forgiving somebody. Pride is that thing that keeps you from showing weakness and asking for advice. Pride is that thing that keeps you from seeking counsel from people that you probably know you should probably get some advice from rather than just kind of trying to do your own thing. Pride is the thing that keeps you from healthy relationships because when you are so puffed up, there's not really room for anybody else. Pride is the thing that keeps you from a growing faith. Pride is the thing that ultimately will block out God because at the very center of the gospel is the fact that we have a need for Jesus that we can't take care of on our own. And pride says, I'm good, I've got it. You can tangibly feel it. You can almost physically feel it. But pride is also the thing that causes you to feel joy when others fail. And maybe you've always done it secretly. Misery does love company, and so there's something in you that likes it when you're not the only one that didn't get it right. Pride is a thing that causes you to devalue other people. Pride is a thing that causes you to ignore warning signs and to ignore wise counsel and ignore what God might have say on an issue. That, that pride is a thing that causes you to cheat in order to get ahead and look successful. Pride is a thing that causes you to believe and to me to believe that we're above something or some one. Pride is a thing that causes us to be defensive. Pride is a thing that causes us to lie about our past, our mistakes, and our achievements. Pride is the thing that causes us to think that God needs us. Ultimately, pride is the thing that keeps us from doing the things that we know we should do, and it causes us to do the things that we know we shouldn't. Ultimately, pride is the reason why relationships go south. Pride is the thing that keeps us from healthy, thriving relationships with one another. But most importantly, pride not only gets in the way of a healthy, growing relationship with our Heavenly Father, but it also distorts our view of God. Because what kind of God needs humans? Not 
a very big one. King Solomon talked about pride as well in the book of Proverbs. In fact, if you were to look to the book of Proverbs, it's, it's wisdom literature. It's all, about, it's all about how life is lived best. Um, there are countless scriptures about the folly and the danger of the prideful and of pride in your life and in mine. And in Proverbs chapter 11, King Solomon, the wisest person that ever lived, he said this about pride, that when pride comes, then comes disgrace. That whenever pride comes, whenever pride shows up in your life and in mine, it always has a plus one. Uninvited, but it always has a plus one. And that plus one is disgrace, regret, shame, embarrassment, burned bridges, and a loss of influence. I love how Eugene Peterson translates this into the message. He says that when pride comes or when they're stuck up, they fall on their faces. That when pride comes, he's saying, predictable outcome. Every single time, disgrace comes with it. And disgrace doesn't look good on you and it doesn't look good on me. It doesn't feel good. And it's why in those moments when we let pride take control, we're almost left wondering, why did I, why did I say that? Why did I think that? Why did I act that way? Why did I treat them that way? Pride, when pride comes, disgrace is always not too far behind. And that word pride, that word pride, it's a word picture in the Hebrew. The word pride literally means boiling up. The, the word means boiling up, and here's the idea. Boiling up, he's describing somebody who is so arrogant that just thinks no boundaries matter. He's describing somebody that is so arrogant and full of themselves that not even like God's wisdom is something they need to pay attention to. That they're insubordinate. They're just like, yeah, I'm gonna do my own thing, my own way. He's describing somebody, this idea of boy and love. He's describing somebody who has this like self-bestowed divinity. Like I am God's gift to humanity. I'm God's gift to KSU. I'm God's gift to my small group. Man, he doesn't even know, but I am God's gift to his life. I am God's gift to this relationship. I am God's gift to my family. Ultimately, what he's describing here, this idea of boiling up, somebody that, can, that feels like they can do whatever, be whatever, that they don't need anything or anyone, he's describing somebody, in summary, that thinks they are smarter than God and better than people. Smarter than God and better than and people. And here's what that tells you and me, and this is so important, if you're taking notes, I need you to write this down, that at the very core, at the very heart and the very core of pride is a distorted view of ourselves in relation to God and others. Don't miss this. That pride is always relational. And by that I mean at the very heart of it, at the very core of our pride problem is a distorted view of ourselves, an elevated view of ourselves, an exaggerated view of ourselves in relation to God and to others. And then Solomon goes on, he says, okay, but then with humility, he says, when humility joins the conversation, when humility comes, it also has a plus one. With humility comes Wisdom. With humility comes wisdom, that the very antithesis of pride, which is humility, it also has a plus one, and it's wisdom. Wisdom that is from God. Wisdom that gives us proper self-awareness. Wisdom that allows us to see the right thing and the wrong thing. Wisdom that gives us a clarifying picture of who we are in our place in relation to God and others. Sum it up, right? Pride distorts, but humility gives clarifying wisdom. Pride distorts our view of who we are in relation to God and others, but with humility comes a clarifying wisdom to know our place before God and others. This is, this is, this is so important. That the core of wisdom, wisdom, the very core of wisdom and us thinking rightly about ourselves starts with a proper view of God. At the very beginning of Proverbs, he writes that the, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. By fear, he doesn't mean like terrified and scared and like shaking from your knees. No, 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 like a, like a reverence, a respect, like an awe. Like I am in awe of your goodness. I am in awe of your bigness. I am in awe of your greatness. I am in awe of your holiness. That God, you're so big, I know you don't need me, but you've invited me. 
I know you don't need me, but you love me. That that kind of humility, knowing our place before a big, holy, and loving God is the beginning of wisdom. But here's the beautiful thing about the Christian faith, and do not miss this, is that our view and our humility in relation to God always finds its way into our relationships with other people. And if it doesn't, then we have the wrong view of God. That the barometer of your humility and my humility in relation to God's bigness and greatness is measured in my humility that I show towards the people for whom Jesus died. That the barometer of my humility, the barometer of me knowing my right place before God isn't just thinking about the fact that God is big, it is then in turn showing humility to the people for whom Jesus died. I wanna show this to you in the scripture. Um, There's this incredible moment in the Gospel of John You've probably, you've probably heard about this or maybe you've read it when you were growing up in church, but Jesus is hanging out with his disciples and then he, he, he puts on the apron of a servant and then he gets down and he starts washing the feet of his disciples. Now, back then, we don't, we don't do this anymore, but back then, you know, they didn't have paved roads and they wore sandals and it was dusty and dirt and so whenever you'd go to somebody's house, there'd be a servant there who would wash your feet And so Jesus gets down and he puts on this servant's apron around his waist and he gets down to the disciples and he starts washing their feet and they're kind of taken aback. I mean, they're kind of like a little shocked. They're kind of like a little surprised. Peter, so much so, tells Jesus to stop. He's like, Jesus, you should not be washing my feet. I should wash your feet. And he pushes back and they have this little bit of an interaction. And and, and Jesus keeps going because he's trying to show Peter a lesson and he teaches him. But Peter's not wrong. I mean, Jesus was God. If anybody was above washing feet, it was God. But here was Jesus' point. Even me as God, I have come to serve and to save. So how about you? And so Peter, in that moment, didn't totally get it. But what's so amazing is years later, after the death and the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension to the right hand of the Father, Peter writes this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. He says, in the same way, You who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Man, we could talk about that for half an hour. Let me just tell you for just a second. You, including myself, every single one of us in some season of our lives, like there are people that are older than you in every season of your life. You ever thought about that? Until you're like 90, right? I mean, until there's nobody else, there's always somebody older than you. I'm telling you, you have got to be intentional about finding those people that are older than you that can speak wisdom into your life. Don't think that just because you're living life that you know what is ahead of you, why don't you talk to people that have been there? But this is the part I wanna focus on. Peter says, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. I'm geeking out on you with these words, but this is just so cool. This word, clothe yourself with, what it literally means is to tie on oneself. The Greek word, that's literally what it means, to tie on oneself. That's the verb form of this word. The noun form of this verb is a servant's apron. And so what Peter is describing here as he's talking about the way that we should relate to one another, he's saying, hey, as you think about your relationship to one another, what he's ultimately saying is, I want you to tie on a servant's apron. And you've got to remember, this is Peter. You've got to understand that when he was writing this, he was most certainly thinking about that moment when Jesus bent down, he put on the servant's apron, and he taught him this lesson in humility, and he got down and he washed his feet. And now Peter gets it. And now Peter is like, in your relationships with one another, I saw the Savior of the world do it. I saw him do it before I even knew that he was going to resurrect from the grave. He tied on the servant's apron, and so that's what we are to do to one another. Hear me. Having a proper view of God. Don't miss this. Having a proper view of God moves from the theological and cerebral to the practical and tangible when we follow the example of Jesus and tie on the apron of a servant in humility towards one another. And Peter now understands this. 
Peter now gets this. And he's saying, I'm going to tie on an apron and I want you to do the same thing. You want to honor God? Tie on an apron. You want to worship God? I hope you sing. That's great. But if you just sing, you're missing it. I want you to tie on an apron. You want to begin to root out the ugly pride in your heart that is ruining every aspect of your life? I mean, I want you to connect the head and the heart to the hands and I want you to tie on an apron, Peter says. I saw Jesus do it, and I'm telling you, follow his example. I want you to tie on an apron. Why? Three points. The first, pride lies. Humility clarifies. Pride lies to you and to me. Pride tells you and me that we are justified to think the way that we think, that we are justified to say the things that we want to say. Pride lies and puffs us up and tells us that we are something that we are not. It whispers lies into our ears about what we are and what we are not. Pride lies to you and me that we are entitled to it, him, or her. Pride lies to you and to me and tells us, hey, it is all their fault. You just sit back and wait for them to come to you. Pride lies to you and to me and tries to make us believe that we know better than others and we know better even than God. Pride lies to you and to me and it makes us believe that sin actually looks better than it really is. But humility, humility clarifies Humility clarifies to you and to me that you and I are not above anything or anyone. Humility allows you and me to think rightly about ourselves in relation to God and to others. Humility allows us to see the greatness and the goodness of God. Humility clarifies and allows us to see, hey, there actually is strength and weakness in admitting that I need help. I want you to tie on an apron. Point number two, because pride hurts, but humility helps. Pride hurts. Pride hurts the other person. Pride devalues the other person. Pride finds joy when other people fail. What kind of friendship is that? I know friends that, are, that have a hard time celebrating other, that they're friends. I have friends that, that, I know friends that have a hard time celebrating their friends whenever good things happen to them. That's what pride does. It hurts. Pride hurts because it just says, hey, I want you to go ahead and do whatever it is that you want to do, no matter who it hurts or who you step on. Just do whatever you want to get ahead. Pride hurts because it fails to consider the other person. But humility helps because humility loves. Humility serves. Humility protects. Humility asks the question, okay, how is this going to affect the other person before I make the decision? How is this going to make her feel? How is this going to make him feel? I want to consider her. I don't want to decide what I want. I want to think about what is best for her. Pride hurts, but humility helps. I want you to tie on an apron. And lastly, because pride, I love this one, paralyzes, but humility mobilizes. Don't miss this one. Pride paralyzes. Pride locks us into our mistakes it makes us think that we're okay, that we're going to be fine, that everything is okay. Uh, pride allow, makes us, paralyzes us by forcing us to withhold forgiveness from other people. Uh, pride waits for the other person to make a move towards reconciliation because it's all their fault. Pride paralyzes. Pride keeps you and me from growing and learning because in our minds there is nothing to learn and no way to grow. Pride paralyzes, but humility mobilizes. Humility says, you know what, I'm going to make the first move even if I'm only 5% wrong because that's what humility does. Uh, humility says, humility mobilizes because it seeks out the other person. It seeks out reconciliation. It does not let the sun go down if you are still angry at a roommate or angry at a boyfriend or angry at a mom or a dad. Humility mobilizes. Humility admits fault in wrongdoing and doesn't just blame, 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 justify, justify, justify. Humility looks to serve. Humility mobilizes. In fact, it was the very humility of Jesus that mobilized him to move down from heaven to take on flesh to eventually live a life and die on a cross that saved the world. Pride paralyzes, 
but humility mobilizes. So I want you to tie on an apron. And look, this is not rocket science. I know you get this. I know you understand that every aspect of your life is going to get better if you root out pride out of your life. So I want you to tie on an apron. Like the kind of person, the kind of Jesus follower that God is looking for to make moves in the kingdom and to build his kingdom and to make an impact in his kingdom and that KSU is the one that ties on an apron. Ladies, the kind of guy that you should be looking to date is one that says, I'm going to tie on an apron. Don't waste your time with anybody else. The the kind of roommate that you want and the kind of roommate that you should be is one that says, hey, I'm going to tie on the apron. The person in this room that's going to change the world is the one that ties on an apron. You want to step into your purpose in college and in these unique seasons of your life, I want you to tie on an apron. You want to learn about your gifting and how God has wired you and how he can use you in a really unique way, I want you to tie on an apron. You want to start changing the way you see, I want you to change the way that you do. I want you to tie on an apron. And Peter He concludes the the idea. People are gonna see this on Instagram and think that I went crazy with fashion. They're not gonna listen to the message. Um, Peter concludes and he says, here's why I want you to tie on an apron. Because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. That word opposes, it means to set yourself against. Call me crazy. But you wanna talk about a pretty easy way to ruin your life? Do something that makes God want to set himself against you. You might think, whoa, I thought God was loving. What are you, what is this, a church? Are you allowed to say that? I say that precisely because God is loving. Because the very thing that defined the work of Jesus, the most humble work that this world has ever seen and the most loving work that this world has ever seen was all that Jesus did for you and for me and it was characterized by humility, putting others before himself. So yeah, God opposes the proud but he shows favor to the humble. He shows favor to those that are gonna tie on the apron. And favor doesn't mean that you're gonna start getting blessed. Favor doesn't mean that you're gonna win the lottery. Favor doesn't mean that your life is going to be perfect. You know what favor does mean? Is that your influence might multiply when you tie on that apron. You know what favor means? That you might start to get a more intimate and clear picture of who Jesus is and it's gonna transform you from the inside out because you decided to tie on the apron. You know what what favor might look like? Favor might look like you having really, really healthy relationships because you decided to tie on the apron. Favor might look like you dating in a way that even if it ends, both of you are okay because you decided to tie on the apron. God opposes the the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. So tie on an apron. getting a proper view of who God is, not being distorted with who you are. I'm telling you, pride will promise to ruin your life, but humility will welcome the favor of God to rest on your life. So the band's gonna come, we're gonna gonna sing a song together, but here's how I wanna end tonight, and we're gonna sing, I love this next song that we're gonna sing, but I just, I wanna create just a moment And you don't have to sit in the moment. You can do whatever you want in in this moment. But as we head into this brand new year, I just want to create a moment and to give you some space where you might be able to repent from pride that you had that you did not even know existed in your heart until tonight. And what does repent mean? It's kind of this big spiritual, you know, religious word. Repent means this. It means to change your mind and change your direction. To change your mind and to change your direction, and I just, I wanna create some space for repentance tonight, for you to identify that the, the, the pride that's rooted in your heart that you didn't even know it was there, the way you viewed God and the way that you viewed people, you didn't even know that it was there, and I just wanna create space for you to just kinda of resolve with God tonight, hey, 2020 is going to look different. 
I'm going to identify ways and I'm going to identify relationships that I need to tie that apron on. Hey, God, I know that I've, I've thought way too highly of myself. I want to repent of that. God, I've kind of been stiff-arming you out of my life because I thought my way was better, but 2019 proved otherwise. I want to repent of that. God, I've treated some people really, really poorly. I want to repent of that. God, I've been an awful boyfriend, and she should have broken up with me months ago, but by your grace, she hasn't, so I'm going to repent of that. I'm going to tie on an apron. So I don't know what that's like for you, but I just want to create some space for you to do that. You can stand and sing. You can sing. You do whatever you want. But I just don't want us to leave here thinking, oh, wow, cool idea. Yeah, he had an apron. Oh, my God, where did he get that? Chili's? No, I want us <laughs> to let it take root in our hearts so that it begins to see fruit in our lives. Because pride will ruin it. But, man, you tie on that apron, you'll see Jesus and people in a brand new way, and the favor of God will rest on your life. Heavenly Father, thank you for the example of Jesus. And thank you that we get to, to follow his humility. We have a picture of perfect humility. Thank you that, 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 that although you could be unapproachable, thank you that you could have just stayed at a distance, that in humility you sent Jesus here, that we didn't make a move towards you. No, you made a move towards us. So, Father, I pray that humility would empower us to have a proper view of your bigness, but that would filter into the way that we treat other people. Otherwise, it is futile and empty. May 2020 be a year where this group of 20-somethings change the world because they decided to tie on an apron following the example of our Savior. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.